Hi, uh, good morning. My name is Keith Coper. Uh, I'm a professor of geophysics at the University of Utah, and I'm the director of the University of Utah Seismograph Stations. Uh, I just wanted to send a message about the earthquakes we've been having, and especially about the earthquake this morning. Uh, so what we had was a magnitude 4.2 uh, earthquake, and it's, it's what's called an aftershock, and uh, it's still related to what happened on March 18th when we had the magnitude 5.7 uh, earthquake. And so when we use the words main shock, foreshock, aftershock, all those words are referring to earthquakes. Uh, and the thing that distinguishes them is that they're occurring at, at different times and with different sizes. So the biggest earthquake that happens during a, a sequence of earthquakes, that one's called the main shock. And then any earthquake that happens after the main shock is called an aftershock. So they're all earthquakes. We just use for, main, and after the prefix to indicate the relative uh, timing for, the, for these events. Uh, it, it might feel uh, unsettling or unusual to have uh, an earthquake like this a month after the main shock. Uh, I think many people felt like the sequence was tapering off and so forth, but it turns out this is, this is pretty normal behavior uh, for earthquake sequences. Uh, you know, on average, the earthquakes that follow the main shock, the aftershocks, they become smaller and less frequent as you move on in, in time. But that's just on average, and each sequence kind of has its own personality. So the fact is we could still have earthquakes uh, that are big enough to be felt, like this morning's earthquake, that, that could continue on for several weeks uh, after, you know, after today. Uh, and, and it's just that on average where they tend to, to taper off. Uh, so it doesn't mean that anything unusual is really going on. Uh, what's, what's unusual is most of us are not used to, to living so close and feeling uh, aftershocks and earthquakes like this. And so it's natural to be su surprised and in some cases anxious. Uh, but just as an example, uh, a couple of years ago, there was an earthquake sequence in Soda Springs, uh, southeastern Idaho. And the main shock there was, was smaller than ours. It was, uh, I think it was like a magnitude 5.3. And yet there was many, many more, uh, you know, felt earthquakes and, and tens of earthquakes, maybe 20 earthquakes that were magnitude four or, or bigger. And they continued on, you know, being felt for in between two and three months. Uh, and so our current sequence that we're having right now in Salt Lake City uh, is not as, as sort of productive as, as that other sequence. Now, fewer people felt that it was a less populated area. Many of you listening to this might have felt the main shock, but not any of the other aftershocks. And so again, it might seem surprising that we're still having the, these aftershocks from our uh, 5.7. And the reason why we have uh, aftershocks is because when you have a big earthquake, it's a crack and you have the crack that happens and then it stops and the earthquake's over. But when you have that movement on what we call a fault plane, uh, you relieve stress right on that fault plane. But then there's sort of a halo around there where you actually increase stress. So you relieve stress in one place and then you increase it a little bit around that region. And that increased stress is what causes uh, aftershocks. And if you, if you add up all the stress changes, it's, it's negative, you know, over time, you know, the, the stress drop from the main shock is going to be bigger uh, than, the, than the stress increase that lead to the aftershocks. But there can be this sort of cascade then where an aftershock happens from the stress perturbation from the main shock, and then it has its own series of aftershocks. And again, they're going to tend to be smaller. And so you get this cascade, you have sort of the parent earthquake at the top that generates larger size aftershocks, which you know, then generate their own aftershocks and, and, and so forth. And, uh, and so that's how it works. Uh, another interesting thing I wanted to mention about today's earthquake this morning 
is uh, it might have felt stronger to you than the shaking than the earthquake uh, from two nights ago, on Tuesday night, I think. And we looked at the data and it's not, it's not just uh, your imagination, it's true. The shaking was stronger this morning than two nights ago, even though the magnitude is the same. So the magnitude was 4.2 for this morning's earthquake and it was 4.2 uh, for the earthquake on Tuesday evening. And so that might sound like a paradox, right? How can they feel different if they have the same magnitude? And the answer is the magnitude only describes uh, one property of the earthquake. So the earthquake moves a certain amount, but it also moves at a certain speed, and it also moves in a certain direction, the, the crack. And so depending on how those things change, the energy can be focused in, in different directions, uh, preferentially. An analogy that I use sometimes when I'm teaching is imagine if you had to describe a thunderstorm uh, with just one number, you know, come up with a magnitude for a thunderstorm. Would you use the wind speed? Would you use the amount of rain? Uh, would you use the time that the storm lasted? You know, you need more than one number to fully describe a, a thunderstorm. And it turns out in seismology with earthquakes, you know, it's somewhat similar to that. We need more than one number to describe uh, what happened during the earthquake and, and, and the speed and the direction and, and the energy and so forth. So magnitude is the best we have uh, and, it, and it's pretty good, but there are these other factors that can control uh, the amount of shaking. And then just one final thing uh, to remind everybody, uh, the earthquake that happened on Tuesday and, and the one this morning, these aftershocks, uh, they didn't really affect one way or the other that much, whether we're, we're going to have a big, you know, a really big damaging earthquake, a magnitude six or a seven. There's still uh, a small probability of that occurring, uh, you know, a, a large damaging earthquake, uh, but it's not that much different, that probability or those odds are not that much different than they were before this whole sequence uh, started. So it's always good to be prepared. For those of us that, that live here in Utah, you wanna have your 24 hour kit, maybe 72 hour kit. Uh, you wanna have batteries, medicine, food supply. Uh, you, you know, you can do things around your house uh, to make it safer. You can strap in your water heater. Um, you can retrofit if you have unreinforced masonry or bricks. And if you're interested in the things you, you could do uh, sometimes if you do something, it can make you feel less anxious, you know, feel like you're doing something to respond to all this shaking, you know, that we're feeling. And so, uh, you know, if you, if you wanted to find out more information about what you can do, you can go to our webpage at the University of Utah. It's uh, called quake, Q-A-K-E dot Utah dot edu, quake dot Utah dot edu. And if you go there, you can uh, access all of our guides on what you can do around your house to feel more safe. You can also subscribe to our Twitter feed. And our Twitter feed is sort of our fastest way of getting information out. It's faster than the web page. And you can also subscribe to uh, a text messaging service. And that's the absolute fastest way to get information about uh, when earthquakes are happening in Utah. And that again, that's all available on, on our web page. Uh, so that's it for now. Thanks for listening. I just wanted to check in and stay safe.